we are basically obsessed with microbes in my lab. And it is very unfortunate for maybe some of you that this is a lunch meeting, um, but we will talk about all things microbial, inc including poop, so get ready for it. We are surrounded by invisible life. Once limited by what we could see with the naked eye or microscopes of increasing power, recent technological advances in DNA sequencing have enabled us to detect and discover entirely novel living organisms. Thus, in less than two decades, the entire field of microbiology has changed. Scientists can now carefully investigate microbes at scales that range from atoms all the way to oceans. And we can understand the role of these microbes in the larger biome that we live in. This biome of microbes consists of a variety of organisms that range from bacteria to viruses to fungi, and they live in close connection with us. In this beautiful image, this is a microscopic image of the gut microbe interface taken by the Sonnenberg and Huang labs at Stanford, Stanford University. What you can see is the blue stained nuclei of the gut. Um, these are the gut epithelial cells or the barrier that intersects between us and our microbes. Separated from the microbes that are in the top left corner, um, only limited by connecting with the microbes by a layer of mucus. So you see that green layer of mucus, which forms essentially a selectively permeable barrier that regulates how our microbes interact with us. But this and other barriers of our body have, are, that we have created are far from impenetrable. Indeed, over 2,000 years ago, the Roman scholar Varro was probably the first one to describe how these barriers can be overcome and how we can be affected by organisms in our environment. Um, Back then, we didn't know that we had microbes, and instead, what he thought was that farmers who worked in swamp lands were more likely to get ill than farmers who worked in dry or arid areas. He then concluded that in these swamp lands, where the water was often cloudy, must be very, very small animals, and that these animals could be ingested or inhaled and cause illnesses. And so he wrote, before the common era, certain minute animals invisible to the eye breed there and, born by the air, reach the inside of the body by way of the mouth and nose and cause diseases which are difficult to be rid of. Now, for the next many hundreds of years, um, we had a, a complicated understanding of the infections that we could be exposed to, but we really didn't know what the problem was. Um, in fact, we had all kinds of fanciful names for the types of diseases that originated from being exposed to dirty areas. Um, we called these things miasma and ether, um, not knowing what was actually at the root of all of this. Now, this all changed when a young man named Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, uh, who was a draper, sought to do something very interesting. He used to work with really fancy fabrics, and what he wanted to do was to be able to evaluate the quality of thread that he used for his draping. Um, in order to evaluate the quality of his thread, at that time, they had magnifying glasses. And so he would look for ever more accurate and fine mag magnifying glasses. Um, but eventually he realized that what he needed to do was make his own lenses. And in that process, he ended up taking up glass blowing and learning how to blow these beautiful spheres of glass. He would then mount these spheres of glass in pieces of metal. And this actually formed the rudimentary light microscope. So the light microscope was invented at this time. And this led to a variety of very exciting findings. Now, if you can imagine when you were a kid and maybe some of you were science oriented and had a microscope, what kind of stuff did you look at? Uh, you probably looked at things like bugs and plants and dirt. Um, and, and while by this time he was starting to become kind of a known scientist, he did exactly the same thing. Um, he looked at pond scum, um, and very famously, he looked at the kind of gross stuff that was between his teeth. This was, of course, be before modern dentistry. And so he noticed he had all this like kind of guck between his teeth, pulled it out with a toothpick, put it on a glass slide, looked at it under a microscope, and drew some of these beautiful images. So in 1676, he described the first unicellular organisms. Um, this was met with a lot of resistance in the field because no animals were that small. Animals were all multicellular, we all knew that, and this had to be wrong. 
Um, so the scientists actually ended up sending, the lead scientists ended up sending external scientists to come to his lab and use his microscopes and, and reevaluate uh, his findings. And actually they were able to recapitulate these findings. So in 1677, it was accepted that unicellular forms of life existed. And this was the first description of bacteria. Now the word bacteria hadn't yet been invented at this point. He called these tiny animals once again, um, and he actually named them animalcules. He found all kinds of different ones, ones that moved, ones that were sessile, round ones, long ones, spiral shaped ones. Um, and this, I would argue, was the first description of a microbiome. So by the 1800s, modern medicine and surgery was coming into full swing. Um, surgical wards around the world were filled with people who were recovering from injuries, soldiers who were recovering from war wounds. And what we knew at that time was that many more of these surgical patients were dying of wound infections than they were of blood loss. Those were the two main challenges in surgical wards. And no matter what we did, we found that patients at this time were getting infections. Now, it could be that you know, this was before the era of modern antisepsis and people did not wash their hands, they did not wear gloves, they did not cover wounds. And so Joseph Lister was actually famous for developing the process of antiseptic surgery, um, where we learn to do things like wash our hands and put antiseptics on wounds after they were uh, surgerized, as it were. The next major breakthrough in medicine in this war against germs, because we knew that there were these germs, by now we had called them bacteria, um, were causing the problem. The next big step forward was the discovery of antibiotics. And the first antibiotic to discover was penicillin, of course. It was called the new wonder drug for mold, and, and that is because that is exactly what happened. Um, Alexander Fleming had been doing experiments with staphylococcus, which is a, a very serious pathogen then and now. And he was growing plates of staphylococcus. Um, in one of his such experiments, his plate ended up becoming contaminated by a mold called penicillium. And when he left the plate and then came back weeks later, what he found was that something that was being secreted by the penicillium, what he called the penicillium juice, was actually killing off the staphylococcus. And in so doing, ended up finding the first antibiotic. Now at that time, the major germ scourge of the world was syphilis. Um, syphilis had been causing huge problems, especially in the wars. In World War I, it was probably the second most common cause of disability for soldiers. And while Alexander Fleming didn't come up with the idea to use penicillin for syphilis, others who were contemporary with him saw this opportunity. Um, and penicillin ended up being used extensively in World War II to treat soldiers with syphilis. So throughout the time between Van Leeuwenhoek's discovery of animalcules and the era of early microbiology, methods popularized by scientists such as Robert Koch, Julius Richard Petrie, and Hans Christian Graham facilitated the measurement of microbes by isolation, culture, and staining. Um, basically, even for most of my own lifetime, this is how we have studied microbes. Um, so I'm guessing at least some of you have plated bacteria out on a Petri dish, which is located over on the left, and then you've put it on a glass slide, and then you've gone through the process of exposing it to a variety of different stains to generate a picture like we see on the right side, a gram stain. And so once again, we were in this era we were, where we were describing microbes predominantly by what they could grow on and what they looked like under a microscope and how they stained. And this is really where we were until very recently. Of course, technology has raced forward in the last 20 years. Following the determination that most life on Earth uses either DNA or RNA as genetic code, strong investments from the United States and international agencies have propelled scientists forward to develop faster, more creative, and accurate ways to see and measure DNA. Thus, with the advent of the first low-throughput and then higher-throughput DNA sequencing methods, it was natural for us as microbiologists to take the next step toward measuring microbes by measuring their DNA. We were no longer relegated to kind of slow and laborious biased methods based on culturing and visualizing bacteria. And thus, in the last 15 years, literally only 15 years, um, we have made leaps and strides in understanding the microbes that live in, on, and around us. Most simply, the majority of the studies that people like me do, we focus on the microbiome, have been centered on kind of a standard pathway. And so this is how we do our experiments. We collect stool, um, we extract nucleic acids like DNA or RNA, 
We sequence them using high throughput sequencing technologies like the ones that were developed for sequencing the human genome. And then we try to answer really simple questions that end up being complex. Questions like, which bacteria are present in this sample? How many of them are there? What are they doing and how do they interact? And even more complicated, what do all of these trillions of organisms make? In order to make sense of these data, remember we're generating huge amounts of data, we need to have bioinformatic pipelines that lever leverage computational power and modern computer science. Since about 2005, efforts that have included the US NIH-sponsored Human Microbiome Project have helped us catalog the microbiomes of various niches within the human body, ranging from the mouth to the skin to the large intestine, also known as the colon, to the vagina. The results have been staggering. Collectively, we've learned that we have over 10 trillion microbes within and on us. Up to 3% of our body mass is made up of microbes. By cell, we are at least as many of them as we are us, and we may even have 10 times as many microbial cells and particles in and on us than we have human cells. And of course, they have way more genetic diversity than we do. Uh, so when we think about genes, which are the functional units of DNA that encode molecular machinery and structural proteins, they have way more than we do. So when we think about how we differ from one another, we can't just think about our human genome, we've got to think about these vast other genes that are carried by our microbes as well. Over the course of those past 15 years, we've learned a lot about the microbiome. We know that the vast majority of microbes reside in the large intestine or colon, where they help to do a variety of things, ranging from extracting nutrients to regulating immunity, regulating our metabolism, and even producing critical vitamins for us. So where do we get our first microbes from? The current thinking is that the baby in utero is likely sterile or nearly so. Um, trace microbes may be present, but we have nowhere near the trillions of microorganisms that an adult human does. The baby is, for the most part, seeded with microbes at the time of birth. And things like birth method, as well as early life exposures, impact the microbiome tremendously. This is actually common throughout the animal kingdom. Um, here we have a picture of a baby elephant and a, a parent elephant. Um, and it turns out that baby elephants actually have, have to eat the stool or the dung of animals in the herd, adult animals in the herd, to grow properly. Um, many large herbivorous animals, for example, cannot extract nutrients from their food properly without these microbes. And so they essentially have to inoculate themselves. Um, just like elephants, um, we require our microbes to grow properly. While for the most part, um, babies do not eat the dung of their adult parents, um, they do require microbes in order to carry out a variety of functions, um, functions that range from metabolism and digestion to immunity. So if having the wrong microbes in the case of the elephant can make you stunt or make you not grow properly, can having other microbes make you grow fat. Um, in this really landmark experiment that was carried out by researchers at the Gordon Lab at WashU St. Louis, uh, what they did was something very simple. They took genetically identical germ-free animals. These were animals that were grown without microbes whatsoever. And they gave them the stool of either an animal that was genetically obese or the stool from an animal that was genetically lean or normal sized. What they found was that the introduction of the stool into the microbiome of these identical animals was sufficient to make one fat and one skinny. It turned out that the microbes that were present in the fat animal were able to extract nutrients much more efficiently from the diet in the fat animal than in the skinny animal, suggesting that we actually have an entire accessory organism or whole organism living within us that is managing how we interact with things as simple as the apple that you're eating for your lunch. So I introduced this concept of the germ-free mice, and I suggested that animals that are born without microbes actually do very poorly. Um, it turns out that this is probably because the vast majority of the immune development that we experience as humans happens in the first three years of life. 
And a lot of how our immune system develops and is formed depends on what types of microbes the immune system interacts with. So if you don't have the right microbes present, or honestly any microbes present early on in life, your immune system doesn't develop properly. If you kind of fast forward to the way that we live our lives now, um, we've moved into urban settings, we live an increasingly sanitary life, we're exposed to fewer and fewer microbes early on in life, and consequently what we have observed in the field is that we have an increased rate of all kinds of diseases. Um, perhaps you guys have noticed this, there's an increased rate of allergy, an increased rate of asthma. Um, when I was a kid, there was maybe one kid in my class who had a peanut allergy. I bet you if we walk over to a nearby elementary school, they can't even bring peanuts into the school anymore. Um, so clearly, there is an epidemiological shift that is going on here. And it's interesting to note that it actually correlates with this increased focus on hygiene and sanitation in our environment. Uh, many have suggested that it's actually the absence of appropriate microbes early on in life that leads to alterations in the immune system and the hyperimmunity that we see in these inflammatory diseases. It turns out that, of course, dietary choices throughout life can also dramatically impact the microbiome. Um, the first dietary choice that you make is not one that you usually make, it's one that your parents make, and that is, of course, the choice to give your baby breast milk versus formula. It turns out that breast milk carries a whole lot of different types of sugars. We call these sugars human milk oligosaccharides. They're li little sugar molecules that are connected to one another in all kinds of different ways. Fascinatingly, these human milk oligosaccharides are not digestible by us. They actually are only digestible by certain gut microbes, such that babies who are given human milk have a very different microbiome than babies that are given formula food, um, suggesting that there are differences that exist and this may actually have downstream effects in microbiome development and potentially immune development. But of course, we continue to be exposed to foods that not only feed us, but feed our microbiomes. Um, the cookie that was in your bag probably did not feed much of your microbiome. That'll be absorbed predominantly in your small intestine. That's for you. Um, the apple that you may or may not have eaten that was in your bag, that is in part for you and in part for them. Um, Fibers, especially plant fibers, contain all kinds of interesting glycosidic linkages between sugars that are indigestible by us, but are digestible by our microbes, such that when we eat, we are not only feeding us, but we are feeding them. Thus, one of the major ways in which we modify our microbiome is through diet. Of course, diet can come in the form of apples or onions, which contain fructooligosaccharides. If you look way down on the list of a processed food that you might eat, you'll also see things like maltodextrin, fructooligosaccharides, inulin. These are additives that also can impact the microbiome. So while the major changes to the microbiome happen in the first years of life, the microbiome continues to develop over the course of a human's entire life. In adults, alterations of the microbiome have been or can be caused by large shifts in diet or lifestyle. That probably isn't surprising to you now um, that you know that what you eat actually impacts your microbiome. So it's been demonstrated, for example, that individuals who go from, from an entirely meat-based diet to an entirely plant-based diet can change their microbiomes. Um, but changes have also been shown to occur as people develop a variety of diseases, right? And these diseases can range from diseases that you think would be related to microbes, like infections, to diseases that you might think are unlikely to be related to microbes, like neurodegenerative disease and cancer. Exposure to a variety of things beyond diet, such as medications and, in, and even environmental exposures to toxins, chemicals, and infectious organisms can change the microbiome as well. Finally, it's been demonstrated that not only are your exposures to inanimate things important in how your microbiome develops, your exposures to other animals is important as well. We know that the microbiomes of individuals who live on farms, for example, is different than the microbiomes of city dwellers, and that the microbiomes of cohabitating adults tend to converge. So while there has been much published research in the microbiome space, um, and there has also been a lot of human genomics research, um, it has mostly focused on cataloging genomes and microbiomes of healthy individuals. 
Um, over the course of the last few years, we've seen a growing body of evidence that the microbiome may shift in individuals with disease states. And thus, we believe that it's actually critically important to understand how these microbiomes are shifting and if we can maybe shift them back to try to make people better. As I mentioned earlier, large NIH-sponsored projects such as the Human Genome Project and the Human Microbiome Project, both now completed, have leveraged the fact that almost all known life has DNA or RNA as its genetic code. And these are, of course, are the sequences or the sentences that are spelled with the letters A, C, T, and G. With recent advances in sequencing technology, as I mentioned, we can now extract DNA from samples like stool, and we can sequence millions and billions and even trillions of letters of these sentences in a single day. Um, so we can generate data at a heretofore uh, unknown rate. And then by analyzing these gigabytes or even terabytes and soon even petabytes of data, we can start to ask, answer questions about how microbes actually affect us. So as Lynn mentioned, I trained as a physician scientist. Um, I was sponsored by an innovative program that uh, maybe some of you have heard of. It's the NIH-sponsored Medical Scientist Training Program. It's been around for a few decades. Um, the idea of the program is it supports a small number of people in the United States, young people, to pursue both a medical degree and a PhD. Um, and this has really formed the basis of my research program, and it influences every single question that I ask, and also how I think about science. And so I thought I would take a moment to introduce you to this idea called Pasteur's Tri a Quadrant. Pasteur's Quadrant is a concept that was brought up by a guy named Donald Stokes from Princeton many years ago in the late 1990s. And the idea is that there is different types of scientific discovery. And you can classify scientific discovery based on its consideration for use, which is on the x-axis, like how useful is it for you and me? And on the y-axis, the quest for fundamental knowledge, right? How, what, are we learning about something really basic here? And it turns out that people like Thomas Edison, who invented things like the light bulb, um, these are really about utility. He was a scientist who was interested in building things that would help people live better. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you have basic researchers, such as Niels Bohr. Um, but there are types of science and types of scientists who not only seek to answer questions that have utility for people, but also ones that explore basic science. And I would argue that the microbiome field is actually ripe for this because there is a huge amount of opportunity to do basic discovery-based science, but also an opportunity to study people such that we can impact their health eventually. Most fundamentally, my group and I hope to save cancer patient lives by understanding and manipulating the human gut microbiome. Um, and to demonstrate that, let me introduce you to this patient. Um, so, I am particularly interested in helping patients like Catherine. Okay, Catherine is probably about your age. She was doing well until uh, around 2014. In 2014, she was diagnosed with leukemia. Um, she was treated for her leukemia with multiple rounds of chemotherapy. She was in the hospital for months and months and months. And I'm very happy to report that her cancer was cured. The problem was, after her cancer was cured, um, Catherine ended up having a completely obliterated gut microbiome, and as a consequence, she developed a disease called C. diff colitis. Now, C. diff colitis is probably something many of you have heard of. It's a really common disease in our hospitals, and it is a deadly form of diarrhea. By the numbers, it probably cost the United States about $3.2 billion per year. There are over 500,000 cases per year in our country, and it kills about 14,000 patients per year. Leukemia and lymphoma patients are up to 10 times more likely to develop C. diff colitis compared to other hospitalized patients. So it should come as no surprise to you that Catherine got this disease. She was a setup for it. The problem is that the way we usually treat C. diff colitis, because it's caused by a bacteria, is what would you think? How do you treat bacterial infections? Antibiotics. But the problem is the whole reason people get C. diff is because antibiotics previously have wiped out their healthy microbes. So if you take a look at this graphic, over here on the far left, you have kind of a pictorial image of what a healthy gut microbiome looks like, right? It's filled, lots of different types of organisms. 
When patients are in the hospital for a long period of time and they're exposed to medications like antibiotics and chemotherapies that can wreck their microbiome, they end up with a microbiome that looks like the picture in the center, right? A much simplified microbiome. It is in this setting that C. diff can really go crazy, okay? The organism grows like crazy, and then it produces terrible toxins. These toxins induce incredibly bad watery diarrhea. These patients often have to go to the bathroom like 20 times per day. They end up very dehydrated, and so it should come as no surprise to you that this is often a lethal disease. And the problem is, for the most part, we try to treat that middle picture with more antibiotics, which just makes that picture simpler and sets them up for cycles and cycles of relapse disease. So creative people thought, you know, if the problem is that we don't have enough gut microbiome diversity in these individuals and that's why they're getting C. diff, why don't we just replace their diversity? And by now, almost all of you have heard of fecal microbiota transplantation, which is honestly an amazing, very simple, kind of gross, um, but incredibly effective treatment for this disease. The idea being that you take the gut microbiome of a healthy individual and you transplant it into the sick person, thereby essentially swamping out the C. diff that is present and making the environment in hospital football for the C. diff to live in. Um, we don't do this by obviously sur surgically connecting people's colon, as we see in the picture on the left. I just think it's a really cool picture. Um, instead, we do it more like the picture on the right. I did warn you. Um, these are exactly what you think they are. Um, this is human stool that has been filtered and processed by Elizabeth Homan's lab at Mass General Hospital into these capsules, or what she affectionately refers to as crapsules. Um, if you're going to give me and her the feedback that these should not be clear, um, we've heard you, and they are now white. <laughs> <clears throat> so Catherine, our patient, literally was on death's door um, with C. diff. Um, she ended up having a fecal microbiota transplantation from uh, an unrelated donor. It was actually a friend of hers who claimed to have great GI health, um, and indeed she did. Um, Catherine is now well. Um, I actually had the privilege to meet Catherine for the first time doing field work in South Africa. She studies um, termite mounds, and I'm very pleased to say that she is also a microbiologist. She studies the interaction between termites and fungi. So. While FMT has been highly effective, um, the FDA has played a major role in ensuring that the regulatory structure is also effective in making these therapies available. But honestly, like, what is really in someone's feces? And is this even possible to know? Um, sometimes I half-jokingly call studying the microbiome, looking at, like, you know, the deep, dark unknown. I really do think this is like space exploration. Um, each and every one of you has microbes that we have never discovered before. You are carrying around entirely new bacterial genera and species in you that you could name if you've discovered them. Um, and this is truly amazing. We have so much to learn from within. Um, but this also ends up kind of complicating how we think about studying these microorganisms because we're, we really only measure the tip of the iceberg right now. So one area of microbiome genomics that is of particular interest to my own lab is exploring this microbial dark matter. Um, we develop methods to directly stitch together pieces of DNA into genomes of bacteria. Um, going from really small sentences of 100 letters to entire genomes of organisms that are millions of letters long. And in so doing, we hope that we'll be able to discover many of these undiscovered fungi, viruses, and bacteria. So how many of you guys have heard of the organism E. coli? Almost everybody. Um, and it turns out that E. coli is a very popular organism. It is commonly used in labs. It's a great tool for doing molecular biology. It's also present in a lot of our gut microbiomes. It's actually a healthy organism. But I'm guessing that most of you have heard about E. coli when it's gone bad. Right? You hear about E. coli in outbreaks um, that are related to contaminated food sources, and people end up getting diarrhea, sometimes bloody diarrhea, and dying as a result. Um, and it turns out that all of these different E. coli's that we're talking about are not the same thing. Um, there are thousands, if not millions, of different strains of E. coli. You can liken it to like flavors of ice cream. There are as, as many as your mind can imagine. And understanding exactly what genes a given E. coli has is critical to understanding whether it's dangerous or not. <clears throat> 
In particular, in our lab, we've become interested in being able to directly measure exactly what genes are in a given bacterium, so we can understand things like which bacteria are present, which ones develop antibiotic resistance, which ones are resistant to begin with, and are these bacteria changing over time? So how many of you in the room think that your bacteria that you have, that you've had probably since you were a baby, some of which you inherited from your mom, are the same exact strain that you were born with? Almost none of us, right? Um, yet, as scientists, we often make the mistake of thinking about bacteria as static and thinking about bacterial genomes as static. It turns out that all of these organisms are evolving rapidly. It's why they're so successful, right? They were here long before us. They'll be here long after us. We live in a microbial world, and they are extremely good at adapting cir to circumstance. Unfortunately, our sequencing approaches right now give us only parts of the puzzle. Okay? The most traditional methods that we started using about 15 years ago, which was called 16S sequence, really only gave us a piece of the puzzle. Some of our more prominent methods now give us more of the pieces of the puzzle, but not enough to really figure out what's going on. Of course, what we want is the whole thing, right? I want to be able to know in your gut microbiome, what is each and every bacterial genome that is present and what can those organisms do? I want to know that because I can then mine them for beneficial effects. Maybe one of you never gets sick when you go over to another country and eat street food. Like, wouldn't that be great to be able to mine that information? Maybe one of you can tolerate milk better than other people, and I can help everybody enjoy ice cream by transferring your bi microbes to others. But it turns out that our best methods, like I said, are really fragmentary. So this is the circular genome of a particular bacteria. This is actually from a human subject who we studied. This is a Fascolarctobacterium species. The name doesn't matter, but just know that its genome is a circle, and it's about two million base pairs. Unfortunately, the other methods that we have end up with a lot of holes and gaps in the genome. And so one of our first orders of business in the lab was to adapt technologies that had actually had been built for completely different purposes. They were built for human genomics and cancer genomics. We adapted that to be able to come up with these nice, nearly closed genomes of these organisms, right? Illuminating the dark matter. When we do that, we can actually start to study each and every microbe in a mixture in unprecedented detail. Over on the left, you can see the time course of a, a, one of our leukemia patients, actually, who underwent a transplantation. Um, you can see that the gut microbiome goes from being complex on the left with lots of different colors to being kind of simple on the right with this big, large, light blue area on the histogram. Um, but that's actually all we knew about the organism. We knew that there was something light blue and we ca called the organism a Bacteroides khaki. With our new methods, what we're able to do is actually generate the really complicated figure on the right. The complicated figure on the right, just so you're familiarized with it, is the genome of that particular light blue organism at each and every time point. And by getting the genome of this organism at each and every time point, what we were able to figure out was that this organism actually evolved new antibiotic resistance to two different antibiotics within those 60 days. Um, we could not only figure that out, we could figure out exactly how it did it. So another medically important question that we have is, you know, how do our patients end up suffering in the hospital? We talked about Catherine, right? Catherine had cancer, was cured of her cancer, and was going to die of an infection. It turns out that that story is not that uncommon. There are many patients we have who were able to successfully treat for their cancer, but they end up having a complication of their treatment, or they end up having an infection that compromises their well-being. And so one of the questions we had was, well, where do people catch their infections from? And so how many of you have been to the hospital or thought about the hospital and heard that people catch infections from healthcare workers who don't wash their hands, other patients, sick family members who visit? All of us have heard this. Um, the question we wanted to ask was, well, if we literally have trillions of microorganisms within us, and some of these are capable of being pathogenic, is it possible that we're actually catching infections from ourselves? Meaning, we have bacteria that are in our gut that are ending up in the wrong place in the wrong time, for example, in our bloodstream causing infections. 
So to illustrate this, I'll just introduce you to another case. This is a, another woman we took care of at Stanford Hospital, a 39-year-old woman with B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. She underwent a stem cell transplantation, which is a bone marrow transplant. This is a potentially curative therapy, but it comes at a high cost of complications. 37 days after her transplantation, she developed fevers and chills. You don't need to be a doctor to conclude that she might have an infection. They took a blood culture, and she grew out this organism, Staphylococcus epidermidis. And our question was, where did this organism come from? It turns out that Staphylococcus epidermidis is on each and every one of us. It's probably on each and every human in the world. It's a common skin commensal, but just because we all have it doesn't mean that we all have the same strain. I would argue that none of us has the same exact flavor of Staphylococcus epidermidis. So just knowing that she had this in her bloodstream was not enough to tell us that she got it from her own skin or did she get it from a healthcare worker who had been handling her IV, for example. One other area that we wanted to investigate was whether or not she might have gotten it from her gut. Um, And that actually ended up being the case in this particular circumstance. Um, Using a combination of new sequencing methods as well as new bioinformatic approaches, what we were able to do was trace this Staphylococcus epidermidis that was in her bloodstream to her colon. Um, And in a collection of patients who we studied within Stanford Hospital over the course of 15 15 months, what we found was that over 30% of our patients who ended up with an infection in their bloodstream caught it from themselves, um, suggesting that how we manage people's gut microbiomes might be really important, right? If we can suppress the growth of organisms that we know can be pathogenic, that'll be really critical. You know, so where are we right now in the microbiome field? You know, I would say, you know, we used to think that they were bad, and then we thought maybe they were okay, and we know that sometimes they can be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I think we can summarize it well by just saying it's complicated. Um, But I think it's that complexity that is beautiful and gives us a huge opportunity to try and learn and then make impact. While early studies have suggested that the microbiome can have important impact on things like cardiac disease, heart attacks, hypertension, obesity, as well as cancer, um, fecal microbiota transplantation for C. diff remains the only microbiome-targeted therapy that is approved by the FDA. So we have a long way to go. Recently, there has been suggestions that Microbes may even have an impact in an area so distant as cancer, um, with studies showing that the composition of your gut microbiome may determine whether or not you respond to our newest and fanciest cancer therapies, like immunotherapy. Given that immunotherapy works really well in some people, but only works in about 15 to 20 percent of individuals, you can imagine what a breakthrough it would be if we could get even 5 percent more people to respond. This would really be a game changer. Um, And there is a suggestion that what's in your gut may actually be enough to determine whether or not you respond. Of course, there's interest in areas beyond cancer. Um, The gut, actually, your gut epithelium holds more nervous cells or nervous system cells than your brain. And so it's no surprise that there probably is this complex interaction between your gut and your nervous system. Diseases that range from depression to schizophrenia, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and autism have all been linked to the microbiome. In small studies, it's been demonstrated that giving individuals with severe autism antibiotics can actually lessen their symptoms for a period of time, suggesting that the composition of the microbiome actually can fine-tune the phenotype of autism. Of course, this has hit the popular press. This is from the New York Times. Can gut bacteria actually explain even things like your mood? But of course, the microbiome has not only made contributions directly to our understanding of health. Um, It turns out that many of the tools that we use in modern medicine are inspired by microbes. So how many of you guys in the room have heard of things like genetic engineering and CRISPR? Everybody's heard of CRISPR. Where did CRISPR come from? Bacteria. So the CRISPR system is actually originating, it originates from bacteria. It's a way that bacteria fight off bacteriophages, which are viruses that specifically infect bacteria. Um, When people first studied the CRISPR system, they didn't study it with the intention of coming up with cool molecular biology tools for us. They studied it just trying to understand how bacteria fight off their natural predators, which are viruses. 
So you can understand how this wealth of organisms that live within us represent a community of organisms and genes and gene products that are tolerated by us and might end up being really great genetic engineering tools. So in the last couple of minutes, I'm just gonna talk about what you can do. Um, you guys have done a huge amount already in supporting people like me to do research all over the country and helping to build the building blocks that will inform our future studies. We've done things together like the Human Genome Project and the Human Microbiome Project, both of which are now completed. I think these are a good start, but I would argue that you know we're only less than 15 years old as a field. And so this is the time to continue investing, to continue to build on the foundation that these projects really started. You guys have the great benefit of actually going and meeting with people in your constituencies. I ask you to ask your constituents why they care about the microbiome, because it is clearly trending. Um, so this is actually Google Trends. I did this search a couple days ago. You can see that interest in the human genome is seasonal, which I think is quite fascinating. It turns out that people uh, Google the human genome less in the summer months. Um, interest in the microbiome is less seasonal, it appears, and it is clearly increasing at a steady rate. Um, and you can see that at this point, it's actually eclipsed the public interest, the US public interest in the human genome. I encourage you to realize that decisions that you help make will impact your microbiome and the microbiomes of individuals and generations to come. An example of this is recent regulations that were um, introduced by the FDA. A common compound called triclosan and, and a related compound triclocarban are antimicrobial agents. Many of you have probably used antibacterial soaps at some point. Um, these soaps used to contain things like triclosan. It turns out that there was no evidence that they actually had benefit for people, and they were really broad-spectrum microbicides. These are broad-spectrum antibiotics. And just like you wouldn't take broad-spectrum antibiotics just because you weren't feeling so great, um, I would argue that maybe you shouldn't be using broad-spectrum antibiotics on your skin daily if it's not needed. Um, it turns out that the decision was made by the FDA to actually ban triclosan, triclocarban, and related compounds in hand-washing soaps. So as of 2017, you could no longer get it in hand-washing soaps. But these compounds still are added to thousands of consumer products, including probably the rug on this floor, the chairs, and many of the clothes that you're wearing, the cosmetics that you might have put on this morning. Triclosan is found in almost every area of groundwater that has been tested in the United States. And so decisions that we all make as a community and that you all help to legislate on actually impact our microbiomes. Despite the fact that our field is young, only 15 years young, um, the impact is now. Every single state in this country has academic and or industry efforts that are focused on the microbiome. Uh, this is just a, a brief overview. And if you wanna see what it's focused on, it's not only focused on things like human disease, ranging from things like asthma and GI disease to cancer, exercise, obesity, fecal transplant, Alzheimer's disease, it's also related to things that you might not think about. Things like, can we manipulate the microbiome to decrease aggression in dogs? Can we study the glacial microbiota composition and understand at a very basic level where microbes came from? Can we understand the root and soil microbiome and might that help us improve agriculture? And how important is the microbiome to things like our fisheries? So as you think about the microbiome, I encourage you to take both a personal look at your own as well as a broader look on what we're doing to our microbiomes as a community and how we can better understand the microbiome and potentially leverage it for improving human health. Um, I want to particularly thank you on behalf of my group. Science doesn't happen by, uh, by oneself, and science isn't carried out by uh, an old person with a pipette man and like a monocle. Um, science is carried out by people who look like this. Uh, this is my lab group. You can see they come from all over the country, in fact, all over the world. Science is really an international endeavor. Um, not only do we have great scientists who were born and raised here, we have scientists who are naturalized citizens, scientists who are visiting scholars. Um, the ability to attract people like this uh, to sunny California is what makes science in the United States as fantastic as it is.
Um, so with that, I thank you for all that you guys do to make science a priority, um, and I welcome any questions. I know you sort of touched on this a little bit, but can you explain, like, this is really fundamental biology, right? This is really at its nascent stage, and, and we only have the, the universe to go on this. Absolutely. So we have literally only touched the tip of the iceberg, right? The fact that it is a major breakthrough to be able to stitch together the genome of a bacteria in somebody's gut microbiome um, at this point just demonstrates how nascent our field is. We still don't know the vast majority of microbes that live in and on us. We know that there may be some relationship, but we still think that there is a huge amount of detail that we need to work out. We know undeniably that they are these organisms are making molecules that speak to us effectively. We don't know what almost any of them are yet. Um, but you can imagine that this may hold great promise in things like not only understanding how hosts and microbes have evolved together over millennia, but also how we can use these compounds to actually potentially better our health. Um, so we are very much at an early phase. We are doing both basic science and translational work um, because, of course, we're all impatient to try and put this work into action. Yes. Um, so in the popular press, people describe a lot of ways to cultivate um, the microbiome. Some of them are pretty non-controversial, like you know, eating more plants, but some of them are somewhat controversial, like not using soap except for your hands. So like among the sort of options that are become the popular press, do you think that any of them are concerning or that you would recommend besides eating more plants? Yeah, so I think uh, in terms of things, I'll start with things that are concerning because I'm a doctor and so I'm trained to worry. Um, in terms of things that are concerning, I think you know, there, there are things like do-it-yourself do fecal microbiota transplants happening out there. I think that's incredibly dangerous. Um, when you think about it, this is like truly a black box therapy. We don't know what most of the organisms are in people gut microbiomes, and there, there's the potential for lots of toxins and pathogens to be passed on. So I think that is an area that really needs to be investigated carefully and regulated well. Similarly, uh, the supplement industry is not regulated in the same way that drugs are. And right now, there's such an interest in kind of do-it-yourself health and improving one's microbiome that there's been kind of a rush to the natural food stores to buy things like probiotics. Um, probiotics, you know, what is on the label may not be what is in the bottle. And even if it is what is in the bottle, it doesn't mean that it's alive. And so I think keeping in mind that a lot of these, you know, simple solutions of things like probiotics um, may not be what you think they are and may actually have the potential to harm is critical. Keep in mind that, you know, this is a symbiosis that has been happening for, like I said, millennia. And likely the most natural and effective ways to impact the microbiome are holistic approaches that reflect the major things that have impacted our microbiome to date. So lifestyle changes, things like changing one's diet. That's why I think there's been a strong focus on getting a variety of different fibers, um, but also minimizing exposure to toxins, right? So toxins that range from heavy metals. We know that things like mercury, arsenic, et cetera, can be very harmful to the microbiome and to our own cells, but also minimizing exposure to unnecessary antimicrobial agents, um, both over the counter, as it were, as well as prescription. Um, so we're still in very early age, very early days. Um, I think right now we're relegated to the realm of a one size fits all, you know, eat a healthy diet, try to maximize fiber intake, avoid supplements where you do not know the provenance of the, the supplement um, and limiting antimicrobial exposure as being the key things. I will say, you know, in general, we should think a bit about how we how we live our lives as well. Um, and you mentioned something about hand washing, where you know wh where should we use soap and why. Um, this is an area that's actually wide open for research. We know very little about the skin microbiome. Um, we we have no idea actually the long term effects of even things like moisturizers on our skin or frequency of bathing. And so this is an area that we still have to investigate. Um, I want to go back to the fat mouse. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and you know, the obvious takeaway is like anybody that wants to lose weight should get rid of their fat, whatever. But um, I'm thinking about food scarcity and malnutrition, and I'm wondering if it's possible and practical to figure out how to put whatever those things are into the guts of people that are facing food scarcity and malnutrition. 
Yeah, so great question around food scarcity and malnutrition, and can we kind of reverse that idea of the you know, bad microbes causing obesity and think about these quote unquote good scavenger microbes being introduced into individuals with malnutrition, stunting, and food scarcity. Um, this is actually an area of active investigation. It's an area of particular investigation in areas of sub-Saharan Africa where there's a very high rate of malnutrition um, in, and stunting as well as uh, actually another type of malnutrition that WHO now classifies obesity as a form of malnutrition as well. Um, it has been suggested that early life exposures are probably critical for putting the microbes in that will actually lend themselves to good energy harvest over time, and that the, the vulnerable period that children have is in the first few years of life, and if they don't get the microbes that'll actually allow them to extract energy effectively from their, from their nutrients, uh, from their food, then it will be very difficult to transplant those organisms in. Um, some of the own work that we've been thinking about or that we've been doing is asking the question, well, when you do a fecal microbiota transplant, plantation, do the organisms stick? And if so, for how long? And it turns out that the for the most part, at least in our work, we found that the microbes that are introduced don't stick around for very long. And that's probably because there are strong other effects that we bring on, both from our own immune systems, as well as our fixed lifestyle, that prevent somebody else's microbes from actually entrenching within our, our gut microbiomes. Um, so I think it's a good idea. I think we have to ask ourselves how to get organisms to stick around for a while. And if they aren't going to stick around for a while, you know, do we have to think about repeated exposures to these microorganisms? Um, in related work, people have been trying to use gut microbiome transplants to treat people with inflammatory bowel diseases, but have found that you actually have to give people multiple fecal microbiota transplants in order for it to work, a very different scenario from C. diff. And so these are some of the big picture questions that the field has to address. Yes? Yeah, so what we found is that in the first month after the microbiome transplant, the individual usually has a resolution of the symptoms. Um, we actually follow these individuals for between 8 and 12 weeks after their fecal microbiota transplantation to confirm that their symptoms of diarrhea have not returned. Um, interestingly, at the molecular level, what we find is that there is a quick engraftment of the microbes from the donor into the recipient, um, but at about a month, everything starts to shift. And somewhere between month one and month six, um, the entire community or much of the community of organisms that was introduced by the donor is actually replaced by a totally different community. Um, which suggests that the, the transplantation is really just a temporizing measure, right? It's a way to get things under control and to stop the C. diff from going out of control while the own host's microbiome kind of slowly takes over. I will say it is a phenomenal treatment, though. There are, having seen patients who got this therapy, they go from having, you know, truly 20 watery bowel movements a day to being able to go home and eat what they want to, and, and being just fine. I will tell you in the case of Catherine, she tells me that her gut microbiome is not quite the same. Um, and it's quite interesting because she ended up getting her transplantation from a friend of hers who she keeps in touch with. Um, so they've actually compared notes. Um, they haven't been molecularly characterized to date. Um, but there is probably something to the fact that, you know, we are really well tuned to our microbiomes um, and getting somebody else's understandably may not always quite match up. Um, about antibiotic resistance, <clears throat> can that research be used and somehow expanded to attack the big problem of antibiotic resistance broadly? Yeah, so we actually are very interested in that space. We're interested in where antibiotic resistance is bred in the hospital. And um, we know that a lot of antibiotic resistance occurs in the setting of long, low level, or even high level exposure to antimicrobial agents. That happens both in the hospital, but actually also in, for example, livestock farming, agriculture, where we have a huge amount of antibiotics that are used in those industries. Um, so one of the things that we're doing on the hospital side of things, since that's where we focus, is we're looking at individuals who are in the hospital for a long period of time and who are exposed to lots of antibiotics and asking if antibiotic resistance is actually bred in these individuals and then if those antibiotic resistant organisms start to spread around the hospital. Um, so we're asking where, are, where is this antibiotic resistance born and how does it spread? 
Um, if we understand how this antibiotic resistance evolves, perhaps we can actually target those mechanisms of resistance development. So in the example that I showed you here, the way antibiotic resistance developed was actually because a couple of jumping genes moved around. Um, and we can actually try to inhibit those jumping genes from moving, and that may be an effective way to actually stem the development of antibiotic resistance. Um, so coming up with these kind of creative and different new strategies to think about understanding how antibiotic resistance evolves so we can prevent that from happening is going to be an important part of, I think, getting ahead of the game in antibiotic resistance. Yes. In addition to the exterior uh, exposure to what uh, bacteria or uh, yeah, food or anything from outside we can get, uh, how about like our genetic makeup? Does that prevent some, even if we ingest it or we are exposed to be part of us? Or? Yeah, so the question was, you know, how does our own genetic makeup impact our microbiome? And it's very interesting to note that it doesn't impact it that much. Um, so work in twins, in monozygotic twins versus dizygotic twins, so fraternal versus identical twins, as well as work that was done in a very interesting study in Israel where they studied um, individuals who have all kinds of different genetic backgrounds but who have a fairly homogeneous lifestyle. Um, they studied their host genetics and their microbiome. And what... Researchers have found in both of those types of studies is that lifestyle trumps host genetics in a big way in terms of affecting the microbiome composition. So where you live, what you eat, who you live with, um, what drugs or medications you're on, those are things that impact your microbiome in an outsized way compared to host genetics. I mean, this for me is one of the areas that is kind of most exciting about the microbiome, right? Because it's, you know, we know, for example, the mutations that cause sickle cell disease. Yet, when we do gene therapy on patients with sickle cell disease, it still makes the cover of the New York Times. And that's because these are really hard things to fix. It is really hard to fix your genome, even when we know what the problem is. On the other hand, given that lifestyle, diet, other choices are the things that in an outsized way affect the microbiome, we can change your microbiome. You can change your microbiome. And so if the microbiome really is a lever that will allow us to change how people's diseases manifest, we can actually work to change the way the disease manifests by changing the microbiome. And so I think that's one of the things that's most exciting about that particular finding. Um, I have two more questions. Two more questions. <clears throat> what do you think about like Activia, Activia and sauerkraut and cooking your, you know, putting all those pickled foods? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is, the people who don't wash their hands after they go to the bathroom, they may not care whether they're making other people sick, but could they be making themselves sick? So good. Yeah. So good question. The second, the answer to the second question, and you know, disclosure, I'm a doctor. Everybody should wash their hands after going to the bathroom. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I, so I think that that, that, is a, that is a critical thing. You know, hand washing has been studied in a variety of different venues. It hasn't been studied, to my knowledge, extensively in the lay public, although it's been studied extremely extensively in the hospital setting. Um, you know, for the most part, um, washing hands after using the restroom or after they're visibly dirty has been demonstrated to be an effective way to prevent the transmission of infections. Now, it is we know, we know for sure there are lots of fecal oral organisms that can essentially be transmitted kind of in a cycle to an individual by him or herself, um, such that, you know, people who have less good sanitary standards from that perspective in, in ancient times and in other parts of the country clearly have a predisposition to getting diseases like hepatitis A virus, et cetera, known fecal oral contaminants. Um, to your previous question on the probiotic sort of organisms, so, you know, there are all kinds of probiotics, live bacterial organisms that can be bought in pills, but obviously they're also a really important part of the way we cook and eat and live. Um, I think that, you know, in general, microbiome researchers are quite encouraging of people eating live active culture foods that are part of their culture. I think that makes a lot of sense. So if you enjoy it, eat it. Um, nobody has done, you know, prospective randomized controlled studies on things like kombucha or sauerkraut or live active culture yogurt to figure out what the impact of these things are on people's outcomes. That's not to say that they might not be helpful, um, but obviously doing these studies is, is expensive and, 
and takes a lot of time. And to be very frank, these more natural interventions have predominantly been funded. The studies of these have been funded by the government, whereas you can imagine for things like drugs or medications, those are studies that are funded by pharma. And you can imagine that there are orders of magnitude difference in the amount of investment in those different types of trials. And so I think that's one of the challenges that we face in the microbiome space. We think that there's a lot of opportunity for our microbiome targeted interventions to make people better and maybe make people better in safer and healthier ways than taking medications. Um, but getting the good, hard scientific data to support that is going to require a major investment. Um, so I, would, I have um, two questions, and one would be, um, have people who um, are going through like anti like, intense antibiotic treatment, have people looked into like freezing their own um, fecal matter before doing that so like, they can get some regularity? And then the second question is, um, do people who like live somewhat similarly healthy lifestyles kind of achieve a similar microbiome, or is um, is it pretty divergent and it's sort of like on a case by case basis? Some microbiomes are better for different environments. Sure. Um, so your second question first, do people who live in the same, like a very similar lifestyle end up having kind of a convergent microbiome? There are probably factors of their microbiomes that are quite convergent and factors that are quite individual. Um, my guess, although this hasn't been proven yet, um, is that every single individual has a totally different microbiome from every other individual on this earth and that it probably is as unique, if not more unique than a fingerprint. Um, so I think that there is a huge amount of variability. But people who share a common lifestyle likely have common features in what their microbiomes are able to do. Um, in terms of the uh, other question, remind me again, it was uh, um, auto FMT, yes. So the banking of one's own stool, we would call that you know, auto fecal microbiota transplantation. There are companies that are actually out there who will freeze your stool for you for later use. Um, one of the things to consider is that right now the only FDA approved indication that I mentioned for fecal microbiota transplantation is relapsed refractory C. difficile. And so right now there's no clear path to how this will be used within the medical system. Now it may be used outside of the medical system. Um, you know, many people have asked you know, oh, well, you know, if I transplanted my 15-year-old microbiome back into me, would I have the GI system that I had when I was 15 instead of, instead of having what I have now? Um, we actually don't know the answer to that question, um, and I think it'll be interesting to investigate over time. Um, I think this is where, you know, basic science studies that look at these same questions in animal models will be actually really revealing, um, because it's been demonstrated, for example, that if you take the feces from a young fish and you transplant them into an old fish, you can actually make the old fish um, phenotypically perform much better. So they actually end up becoming much more fit, um, suggesting that there is something to the function of that young microbiome that might be beneficial to an older animal. Um, but but it's, uh, these are early days. Probably do. So the question is around, you know, antiseptic, uh, not, mm, current antiseptic approaches, you know, things like hand sanitizers, mouthwashes, um, these... Yeah, many of them are alcohol-based. Many of them have additives that are essentially alternatives to triclosan. So as soon as triclosan came off the market, you can see that certain soaps came back on the market saying they're antibacterial and they just have a new agent. So while triclosan and triclocarban were banned, lots of other antimicrobial agents exist. Alcohol is a, a, a fairly effective um, antimicrobial agent and disinfectant. But I would just keep in mind that things like the mouth, you know, the mouth is far from sterile. We have a huge oral microbiome. So the idea that we will kill off all the microbes is foolish. And the idea that these kind of untargeted approaches will kill off only the bad microbes is, is probably naive. Um, and so I think we have to rethink how we consider antimicrobial agents, for example, in oral care. Um, you know, a, a very famous toothpaste brand um, that I won't name here, it actually still contains triclosan. And some of our own work has demonstrated that the triclosan containing toothpaste can actually change the gut microbiome. 
Um, so, uh, you know, the jury is out on whether or not having antibiotics in uh, an agent that is intended to cleanse an area that is full of bacteria and it's, it's supposed to be full of bacteria is a good idea. And then, Well, I do want to make a point that I think what's interesting is that you're, you're a doctor, but then you go to certain doctors and they recommend using this product. Absolutely. And this is where, you know, it's complicated right now. The, you know, for example, the, the dentistry associations and various medical associations have, have, uh, evolving recommendations on these sorts of topics. Um, and I think that revolves our evolving understanding of the microbiome. I mean, when I was a kid, all germs were bad and they were to be eradicated from this earth. Um, now we have a little bit more of a nuanced view of this. And you know, just as things have changed over the course of history, I think we're experiencing a very accelerated version of that change in part because the pace at which we can acquire knowledge is unprecedented. Um, so I, I realize that it's a challenging thing to be amidst this transition, um, but I think it is incumbent upon professionals and professional societies to be active in seeing what's out there and trending and commenting upon it in the way they best can. Mm -hmm.